Our speaker is a camera developer and also a, a film director. We're looking to a view of a cinematic uh, camera development. He'll describe to us how this project was started. It was self-made. And the goal was to have a cinematic effect, uh, for example, uh, these um, limited range of film effects. It started in 2006 and he came in at 2008 and he can um, explain more. Have fun. We're in the Central Film Archives of Austria. There's over 500,000 films here. And there's many millions of meters of film here. It's a great place to have this talk here. It's online, of course, it's different this year, but we're doing the best we can with what we have. And it's nice to sit here. And this can, this location can bring us something. This is a chance um, to come out of the crisis this way. After the talk, there's a live question answer period. Um, it's online. And let's go back to the uh, old ages. That's back in 2001. And it was clear that everything in a uh, cinema was uh, filmed in analog at this time. There was a lot of post-processing that was happening, and more and more films were going into digital production, but in the middle time, uh, there was still the no normally filmed on analog. Uh, it was very slowly, was changing. What actually is analog film? It's um, going to be a sensor that's light sensitive on the film. Uh, with light contact, the base will have a chemical reaction and it will develop and it will fix the base. And then when you film through it or you can cut it and then um, stick it back together, in the end, every copied film roll will be sent to one uh, cinema and then that one will be projected. This was standard technical um, process for over 100 years. And so this was for over many generations. And then there was a, a new revolution happening um, in the 2000s. Uh, it was a big change. Uh, it, it was a disruption technology. There was a pressure that the film should be all digital all of a sudden. Why? Well, you save a lot of money. This analog film was very expensive. The development was really expensive. The, to uh, produce it is, is expensive. Everything is expensive. Um, digital world to have uh, uh, to save everything is very cheap. And then to edit a computer is uh, cheaper. It's another dimension in terms of cost. And then you have different possibilities. Uh, you can the acquisition uh, there's a there's a period here where there toy story was the first um, animated digital film and this is still is already pretty old for us at this point 
Und, äh, uh, was Once Upon a Time in Mexico with Rod Regrish, um, George Lucas with Star Wars Episode 2 was the first big production um, in Hollywood, a big project, the first films that was completely made digitally and it was um, done through um, a television camera. This was the only possibility to do it in high definition uh, and do it in uh, 24 uh, frames per second. The cinema camera was development was still in kindergarten at this point in comparison to the television cameras. It was only in the beginning. Uh, it wasn't good enough yet. In the cinema, it had to develop over a 10 year period. The, it had to consider how do you bring about the cinematic aesthetic? How do you produce this um, uh, picture quality? How do you actually produce this cinematic aesthetic? There's a typical um, film process that you see, Flickr, um, that comes through the 24 frames per second um, in comparison to uh, the television, then um, it's uh, coming faster, um, it's coming fluidly. Uh, cinema is then uh, slower in comparison. So, as it's going through the projector, it's being pushed through, and then the light is also um, pushing through the film. And then there's a pulse that happens because of this. And, and then it's um, differently uh, different in the end what the aesthetic comes out from it. We have a high frame rate. And then uh, it's going to be uh, higher in comparison. So you have a big project. In 2012, you have The Hobbit. And then you have a, a very high frame rate for all of the very fast action that was happening. And for some time, there was a similar trend for TV technology. Smart TVs were uh, creating intelligent intermediate pictures to uh, upscale um, 24 images per second to 48 and more. So they were marketed as clear motion, motion estimation and stuff like that. And the result was the uh, Hollywood pictures that were produced very expensively uh, were looking suddenly like a cheap soap opera. It was completely, completely flopped. HFR is no longer something that uh, people produce with. So it uh, has kind of disappeared. The film grain uh, results from the um, random distribution uh, on the negative. Uh, and uh, as opposed to the digital uh, image sensor, which has always the same uh, distances. So every image has this random distribution. So you can see the from the negative or from the film, the random distribution dissolves into the uh, motion. So it uh, looks like it is more def defined, has a higher resolution. There was a um, vendor for um, cinema uh, cameras and they had a image sensor where they were vibrating the sensor, uh, moving the uh, sensor for every image uh, less than one pixel. So um, it, this worked, but it was uh, way too uh, expensive and way too um, uh, difficult to, to do. And now the shallow depth of field, which is something that most people probably associate with the cinema aesthetic, uh, and that depends uh, on the projection or on the um, sensor, so the sensor or the negative. And the size one of the of an APS-C sensor um, corresponds about to uh, about the size of a uh, Super 35 negative. The difference uh, to a um, um, photo camera 
35 millimeter film is uh, the, the the film is positioned on the left and then moves to the right which means it is a bit larger than the film that is moved uh, horizontally for cinema uh, cameras which can use only a slightly smaller um, opening and um, 35 millimeter has uh, about uh, two thirds, um, only comparable to uh, 60 millimeters film. So, which means that a TV um, image is has a lot more uh, sharpness in the uh, in the uh, depth of field. And then there's also the uh, dynamic range, which says the, which is the um, ratio of the darkest and uh, brightest spots in the image, which is in TV, uh, you see clipped highlights, that is white areas that are oversaturated, um, clipped. And we know that from audio recordings, when it's uh, too much gain, then it, then you hear some sort of uh, noise. And that is comparable to digital images that don't have any more information because they have uh, too much brightness. And that is the uh, result of a dynamic range that is too low. And one of the very typical <coughs> things that happen with TV um, recordings. Uh, the film uh, negative, um, Kodak uh, has said, has about um, 13 f-stops uh, dynamic range, and uh, TV cameras have been uh, below that, but currently cinema cameras are in the same range. Uh, but in TV, um, and you can see it with live um, uh, TV, um, there's, there's often clippings. So back to the year 2001. Change from um, camera, uh, TV uh, technology to uh, cinema it can't be stopped anymore. Uh, so as I said, it's, it's a lot cheaper. So this is where technology is going. Storage is cheap. Uh, camera technology is being replaced by or is being um, caught up by um, uh, computer technology. So in 2005, there's still no real camera that is comparable to an analog negative. And it's obvious that when this technology is, uh, has, has arrived, it will be first uh, available for Hollywood studios because they have the money. Uh, but the potential has been recognized. So uh, they're using tricks to um, approach this uh, cinema aesthetic. And one of the uh, these, these tricks was an optical 35 millimeter adapter, which is uh, essentially a um, matte screen where uh, the matte screen is semi-transparent. And then you uh, project the image onto this matte screen, uh, which is then recorded uh, using a cheap uh, camcorder. So you kind of get uh, the cinema aesthetic for cheap. The problem with that matte screen, of course, is the uh, surface structure. Uh, of this matte screen, which means that if it isn't moving, the matte screen, you will see this structure after some time. So people started to think, how do we move this matte screen so it uh, blurs in a way? And there were rotating adapters or vibrating adapters where the matte screen uh, was losing the structure due to this motion. But that meant you have a motor with energy supply and it also causes noise. So that um, wasn't uh, successful uh, as soon that, as larger sensors became available. 
und hat auch eine bestimmte äh, mixture dann of the film and the television technology in this time um, in the online form there was a dutch filmmaker they were um, exchanging information about how to adapt this technology to a film camera there was an america um, film manufacturer uh, they produced something but um, this is the first one that was all open source with software and hardware together and it's good for film and the first one I was uh, 600 800 dollars it was relatively affordable and it also had a relatively high resolution it was standard HD standard HD, also um, to have full uh, HD was uh, relatively one of a kind at the time. In this moment, in 2006, this was the birthplace, uh, birth time and uh, beginning of this project. There were uh, on these online forums, uh, they were discussing these uh, problems from people from all over the world. There was development, there was a community um, that was available to everyone, and the, this was the core first part of the project. It was open source cinema and the development of this the open source film camera. So there are many projects uh, that were adapted to 35 millimeter cinema cameras. Uh, for example, there's this theme, World Force. It's not just the camera that's open process, uh, open source, but also the entire film process would be open source. The challenge of the room. Or this whole is the camera okay? Sequence take one. The first big uh, uh, processors uh, for, were from Canon, for example. They are compact cameras with the video. Um, they're SLDR cameras that had this function for a symbol, for an indie camera. Uh, uh, for example, the Canon um, 5D Mark II was a staple in this community. Uh, they had difficulties. Um, they needed to have a new open source project. 
that they can go to. And in 2009, the camera, uh, Canon camera was reverse engineered. Und eben genau diese Probleme and then this was called the Magic Lantern Project. Magic Lantern Project genannt. Uh, there are also Magic other um, mirror reflex cameras. There are many effects here. And um, the Canon didn't want others to be able to do this. Um, these SLDRs didn't have uh, video um, capabilities often. Many manufacturers had um, the different cameras available for cinema production on the market in 2012. Eastman Kodak, one of the biggest camera negative product producers in the world, the they were then um, considering if how much was film production left, and actually this market was broken. It became a niche in the future. There was a handful of 35 millimeter cameras that were uh, used for a project. Uh, a lot of times these were rented instead of owned. Das war sogar bei den großen Hollywood Studios nicht anders. All of the technology was becoming digital. Uh, this had an effect on the uh, market. There was a paradox in the situation. Um, how do you actually afford all of this? And then they weren't accessible. So there was competition from every part of production, every uh, part of the market. Um, they, on one hand, they were blocking the production, and then they had their own particular uh, production. Um, they had a black box of uh, proprietary software and hardware, and then they can't open it and they can't repair it, for example. As only licensed partners or their own company was allowed to uh, do <coughs> maintenance. So the possibilities uh, were uh, actually decreasing, even though possibilities were increasing. And uh, also the uh, lifetime of a project uh, of a product was uh, decreasing by a lot uh, because new products were coming out all the time, which meant that uh, support was uh, no longer uh, as interesting. So Magic Lantern became uh, a, radicaliz a radicalization pole of this uh, new <coughs> trend. So they wanted to create a new uh, camera which should be changeable, modular, uh, compatible to all the standards that were already existing, which is the birth of the Axiom. So everything uh, is being developed uh, uh, under GPL for software and the sell open hardware license for hardware. And the further developments are being shared with the public and the community. The first prototype, proof of concept, is being uh, presented in MetaLab, the Vienna hackerspace. The camera runs Linux, and all the uh, image processing happens in an FPGA uh, in real time. There is no uh, propri uh, proprietary uh, PCOS, uh, everything is open source. The team is from the uh, is very diverse. Uh, there are software developers, hardware developers, uh, mechanics for uh, filmmakers, artists, and all are uh, walking towards the same goal to create tools that you can change, understand, and uh, extend. And this doesn't only uh, concern being able to repair, but also uh, many other uh, fa facets. Uh, there's, uh, filmmakers often talk about the look of a movie. That uh, means all the elements that, uh, for, for image composition, the uh, film stock that has a specific characteristic, the colors, the uh, lightning, uh, lighting, the visual character. 
uh, which is kind of the um, the, the, the handwriting of a director, um, which means that uh, they can use it to uh, make uh, their movies uh, easily recognizable. So, uh, as it was, uh, uh, as in the, in the past, people chose their specific film stock. Uh, now they are um, choosing their specific camera. This is the result of proprietary image manipulation. And uh, it's a secret what happens inside these cameras. So the axiom with all these uh, ways to um, uh, may have an influence uh, on this, uh, this process, uh, there's a lot more possibilities, uh, both in terms of technology and creativity, to uh, influence that. Axiom Beta is the second generation hardware. It's a lot smaller than the prototype. It's a lot more modular and it is being produced for developers in a small series production. Uh, it used to be a manual process. And uh, for a few years, or uh, this year, since 2021, it's being uh, produced industrially. Is a second generation of metal um, housing prototype, uh, and uh, now uh, very fresh. There's, uh, it's possible to uh, write uncompressed uh, media to uh, solid state. To solid state media. So the technology has been has evolved. It's more uh, powerful, but it's less uh, accessible, and that doesn't improve. So the mission of the Axiom project is relevant and exciting as it was on the first day. Thank you very much. Vielen, 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 vielen Dank, Sebastian. Internet. So the internet has uh, some questions. First question is, um, how much is it in use? Also, we have um the 50 developer kits schon gebaut and verschickt international. The next step uh, to the development kit or production camera. What everyone wants uh, from a camera, a house, a development of uh, face, 
is gerade mitten in der Transition sozusagen. Das heißt, da sind wir noch dran. That's the actual stand. Das ist in etwa der Stand der Dinge im Moment. So we were talking about proprietary cameras before. The question was that normally uh, also refers to the data. So the data is proprietary as well. So isn't that a problem for archiving in 20 to 100 years? So there's tools coming from um, different uh, manufacturers that can be manipulating just like the acquisition, the data structure, the metadata um, is all proprietary, uh, so of course uh, that's difficult. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question, uh, is everything open source or is this also uh, the, the schematics, the uh, Verilog, the source code, everything? Actually, everything is open source. This is open hardware, the schematics, the materials, of course, the firmware and software is also open source. Very cool. Question, what kind of uh, optics can you use with a camera? That's a big theme right now. So we don't want to bring it to where the manufact manufacturers have brought it to. Uh, E-mount. There's a distance. The sensor uh, surface in between um, the lenses. And then there's a mechanical adapter. It has an 18 millimeter focal distance. Uh, this is usually longer for the SLDR camera. Uh, so then usually you can mount any lens on top of this. Thank you. There was a question regarding HFR. Why can't you add motion blur in post-production as a digital effect. And one of the largest arguments against HFR was supposed to be that. So this is an argument for it. It's, inten it's intensified, this argument. Normally, when you film with a hybrid setup, the frame rate uh, we'll have motion blur, and this is, is maybe the most uh, comfortable rate. We don't know right now um, a natural feel, uh, feeling effect from a digital um, in, incurred motion blur. I've never heard of it, at least. I would like to try it if there is one. I would like to see if it actually does work, if it's digital for motion blur, and see, uh, can you actually film it this way? And you're asked to explain how a typical post-production flow on open source basis might look like. Um, open source basis aussehen könnte. Fundamentally, the first part is acquisition. Uh, so acquired and then backed up. And then you uh, make a daily from this footage. So quickly put together something from, then see if it's good enough or then um, edit it further. So this is um, the classical version of post. Or if you need something, you can go back to the original and see if you can find something else. Or there's also um, computer techniques and uh, um, digital copy place. It's then not a typical workflow. Um, you look at what the manage data management actually needs at this point. Right. So people are interested in uh, is uh, on the fly encryption implemented? From the video data? Yes. 
von Videodaten? Uh, oder? Ja, der, die Aufnahmen. I would think fundamentally it's not a problem. Um, maybe a problem if it's ha ha working with excessive amounts of data. Uh, maybe it doesn't make sense to encrypt it. But in principle, you could encrypt it. It, in the recorder, in Linux, you could have it on board. It's one of the tools that's possible to implement. Thank you. Next question is about the image stabilization. Is an access stabilization in camera? Uh, some uh, vendors do this in body, some vendors do this in the lenses. Uh, there's no active build um, picture stabilization with this. Thank you. And the last question is a mass production plant. That's an interesting question. Uh, what is a mass production? For us, uh, for us, it has a other definition. Uh, what amounts are actually being produced? The dream is when we are uh, producing it in a factory, but then it's a question of finances right now. What volume is possible? A hundred, uh, if there were a hundred of these produced for us, that would be uh, mass production. And then uh, it would be profitable to produce. Okay, so there's some more questions. Uh, can we continue? Yeah. Uh, are there sequences in XSR? There's a viewer raw format. Maybe a wiki's the wrong word. There's a build, uh, picture sensor. There's a 12-bit per pixel uh, format. It's not really a data structure. So it's a per pixel and then saved by to the file. Um, that's the data for the raw data. Or if you're putting it into a different file is a different question. This would be the next step that should happen. Thank you. Can the Axiom Beta Compact uh, be used without infrared filter for infrared um, recordings? Yes. Uh, either on the developer kit or compact in between the lens and the sensor. It's an infrared filter or UV filter. So you can take that. Um, so it's it's like um, putting together Legos. Do you want to remind us the, of the resolution of the camera? It's 12 megapixels. It's a 12 bit depth of field at uh, full resolution. And then 8 to 12 bit is a little bit slower. And then people are asking if it's possible to combine two cameras for a stereocoptic uh, picture. We haven't done that yet, uh, but all the hardware is there fundamentally. Uh, uh, it might be interesting to try to synchronize the data coming in from the two different sensors. And then what do we need in terms of the uh, accuracy coming from this? But fundamentally, you could, um, if you build the communication between them, you could combine them. It's interesting questions if you need to uh, alter this at all. Okay, so you're uh, doing the uh, most questions. Um, <laughs> thank you for your great talk. You're very welcome. Um,